power for life. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has secured his third term, making him the first to hold the position for this long since Mao Zedong. He faced zero competition, with zero votes against him. Plus, he stacked his cabinet full of his loyalists. With growing scrutiny on him, Xi Jinping is now lashing out at the United States, naming Washington directly in a rare show of directness. But is it all for show? to bolster nationalist pride inside China, or is this a foreshadowing of what's to come? And how will it impact Taiwan? What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Power for life. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has secured his third term, making him the first to hold the position for this long since Mao Zedong. He faced zero competition, with zero votes against him. Plus, he stacked his cabinet full of his loyalists. With growing scrutiny on him, Xi Jinping is now lashing out at the United States, naming Washington directly in a rare show of directness. But is it all for show? to bolster nationalist pride inside China, or is this a foreshadowing of what's to come? And how will it impact Taiwan? Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Chinese leader Xi Jinping might hold his power for life. He officially secured his third term Friday, making him the longest serving head of state in communist China after Mao Zedong, the first head after the Communist Party came to power in China. The vote favoring Xi tallied over 2,900 to zero. All of those voting lawmakers appointed by the Communist Party. Uh, as long as he's alive, or at least um, able to function, uh, he's going to be in control of the Chinese Communist Party. What's more, Xi just completed a cabinet reshuffle, filling Beijing's top leadership roles with loyalists. He's now surrounded by more cabinet loyalists than any other Chinese leader has been in decades. And that support may be fueling the regime. In a rare move this week, Xi took direct aim at the U.S., saying Western countries led by Washington have implemented all-around suppression and a siege against China. In identifying the United States in name, he's uh, drawing lines uh, in, in the sand between um, his vision for the world, his vision of, China, of uh, his interests, and um, how the United States opposes that. So it's just another symptom of how this a Cold War is becoming colder. It's becoming more intense. But the Communist Party leader still faces a myriad of challenges, both at home and abroad. China's economy is still reeling from three years of strict pandemic-driven lockdowns. Investor confidence in China is waning, and a demographic crisis is looming, as China reported its first population decline in six decades. On the international front, Xi's approach to Taiwan is putting Washington on alert. Beijing seems to be ramping up preparations for war. It's opened more than 100 offices to mobilize defense resources across the country and launched a cell phone app to help residents in the city of Xiamen react during wartime. Xiamen is located just across the water from Taiwan. The regime also aims to boost defense spending by 7.2 percent this year, a faster pace than the country's GDP target. Bradley Thayer is a founding member of the Committee on the Present Danger China. He says the U.S. military should have a strong presence in Taiwan, noting that America relies on Taiwan for the world's most advanced microchips. He explained why the island of Taiwan is a thorn in Beijing's side. And most importantly, it shows what China could have been. If the communists hadn't won, uh, China today could be as democratic as Taiwan. It could be as prosperous as Taiwan. It could be as free as Taiwan. So Taiwan's existence is a very important symbol of what China could have been and what it someday might be. Thayer is urging the U.S. to speed up decoupling from China and strengthen the nuclear arsenal. That's to send a message to Beijing that it wouldn't survive a conflict with the West. The Chinese Communist Party is tightening its grip on the nation's data and monetary resources, that action coming in the name of structural reform. NTD's Sam Wang has the latest. China's rubber stamp parliament approved a new plan Friday, seeking to reorganize institutions. 
It includes establishing a national data bureau and a financial regulatory body. The new financial body is designed to close loopholes within multiple agencies that oversee the country's money-related services. In other words, it takes the power to supervise out of different sectors and puts it directly into the hands of the state council. Song Guocheng, a researcher from National Chengqi University in Taiwan, says the move is telling about how the CCP functions. I don't think it solves any issues. The whole ideology of the CCP is to have everything monitored, supervised and controlled. This is a serious ideological problem. The National Data Bureau, on the other hand, will be responsible for coordinating the sharing of data. It will also gain oversight on China's internet while ensuring the CCP's access to the information. A professor of Taiwan's National Yunlin University says that data is vital for the CCP. The CCP has recognized the necessity of centralizing data control. To establish a national database, they combined the Cyberspace Administration and National Development and Reform Commission to strengthen their data control. He added that otherwise, China will face tremendous challenges from other countries in the fields of business, science and politics. Sam Wang, NTD News, New York. Following reports that Beijing is running illegal police operations on American soil, a New York Police Department officer is now reportedly backing the Chinese Communist Party on Douyin, China's version of TikTok. In a video, he appears to threaten a U.S. resident. The person had been arrested by Chinese police for opposing Beijing's stringent zero-COVID-19 policy in China. The officer asserted that the resident would be sorry if the officer found her after returning to America. The comments came from Officer Ben Hu Wong, a five-year veteran now serving in the 79th Precinct in Brooklyn. His threatening remark, possibly causing reasonable fear of harm for the Chinese national living in America, Ms. Jiang. During her visit to China in December 2021, she argued with a local pandemic prevention worker over anti-COVID-19 rules. She was then arrested for 10 days in the city of Xi'an. A strict lockdown was imposed on the city's 13 million residents at the time. Since then, reports of the immense human cost of Beijing's zero-COVID-19 policy have emerged online from locked down residents starving at home to pregnant women suffering miscarriages and citizens getting publicly shamed for violating virus restrictions. Various critics have condemned China's harsh lockdowns, but not Officer Wang. Another video posted on TikTok also highlighted Wang's ties to the CCP. It shows him singing the CCP's national anthem while wearing his New York police uniform. Back in 2014, Wang was praised in an article by the state-owned Chinese newspaper China Daily for contributing to the rise of Chinese-American officers in the American police force. He was serving in the 109th Precinct in Flushing, New York at the time. Russia's state-owned nuclear power giant allegedly sending enriched uranium to China. A U.S. official remarked on the news during a hearing this week before the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Strategic Forces. Rosatom is a Russian state company specializing in nuclear energy. And reports say it's supplying China's fast breeder reactors. Here's why that matters. There's no getting around the fact that breeder reactors are plutonium and plutonium is for weapons. So I think uh, the department is, is, is concerned and of course it matches our concerns about China's increased uh, expansion of its nuclear forces as well because you need more plutonium for more weapons. The reports come months after a string of headlines in December. At the time, diplomats from Beijing and Washington said they met for talks aiming to cool military tension. The same day, Russian engineers delivered a large shipment of nuclear fuel to a remote island. Known as Changbia Island, it sits just 120 miles off of the coast of Taiwan. The small landmass is home to one of the world's most eyed nuclear facilities. U.S. Intel says it's used to produce weapons-grade plutonium, with estimates saying that in the next 12 years, material from the facility could quadruple China's weapons stockpile. A buildup on that scale would put Beijing's arsenal on par with the U.S. and Russia. China and Russia have placed nuclear weapons, space warfare and long-range strike at the center of their strategies to counter the United States and our allies and partners. 
Driven by those details, a group of U.S. lawmakers presented a new bill Friday. If passed, it would ban Russian uranium imports. Ultimately, we should have two shared goals, ensuring our credible deterrence and strategic advantage over our adversaries and reducing the number of weapons and chances of warfare on all sides. Supporters say halting purchases from Russia would have several effects, financially cutting off Moscow as it continues its war on Ukraine, reducing U.S. dependence on Russian energy, and spurring uranium production on home soil. Currently, the U.S. is unable to fully produce enriched uranium. Congress is keeping its focus on China. Lawmakers say the Chinese spy balloon is just the tip of the iceberg of Beijing's presence in the U.S. China's ownership of U.S. farmland has multiplied 23 times from 2010 till today. Those remarks came from the chairman of the Homeland Security Subcommittee during a hearing on Thursday. It aimed to explore the threats of the CCP on U.S. soil. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with more. Witness William Evanina, who served as a national security official under both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, says that this is a comprehensive strategic plan that's been in the works for the past decade. Of the Chinese be able to do software and malware manipulation penetration on electrical grids and power stations outside of the military bases. It's important to note that we are not talking about Chinese citizens or Chinese Americans. We are talking specifically about the government of China. Democrats and Republicans have paid close attention to that CCP-run police station in New York City. And while Communist Party officials deny it, lawmakers aren't buying it, saying that it's unacceptable for the CCP to be using surveillance techniques here on American soil to target and harass Chinese nationals who are willing to speak out against Communist Party views. We're just scratching the surface. We have so much work to do in order to keep Americans safe and really expose the truth about the links that the Chinese Communist Party will go to. And this is one of a string of China hearings in the Congress over the past two weeks. And it comes as Chinese Communist Party officials are warning the U.S. to hit the brakes, otherwise face, quote, conflict and confrontation. Congressman Lou Korea, who sits on the subcommittee, tells me he feels that right now U.S.-China relations are, are at an all-time low. He also expresses the need for the U.S. to play more of a role on the global scale to prevent China from further exporting it its anti-freedom values. Suppression, communist country versus democracy, our open democracy, First Amendment freedom of speech, these things that are important. As for solutions, lawmakers tell me the first step is to shed light on the issue and then show strength to Beijing. Chairman August Pfluger tells me that he doesn't believe conflict with China is certain, but he says that the first step towards deterrence is to defend the homeland. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Washington is not seeking a technological decoupling from China. This from U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo on Friday during her India visit. The United States does not seek to decouple from China, uh, nor does it seek a technological decoupling from China. The U.S. is tightening its export restrictions on chip-making technology to China. This is aimed at hobbling Beijing's ability to enhance its military. China's explicit strategy is to have these technologies uh, and deploy them in the Chinese military apparatus. Those are technologies that we have uh, used export controls to ban the sale of to China. Raimondo added that most trade with China doesn't pose a threat. So we enjoy tr trade with China. The vast majority of trade with China uh, is in benign products, and that will and should continue. So this isn't about decoupling. Earlier this month, former President Donald Trump laid out his plan for trade with China if he's re-elected. And I will implement a four-year plan to phase out all Chinese imports of essential goods and gain total independence from China. We have to do it. In his first term, Trump launched unprecedented economic sanctions on Chinese companies and blacklisted dozens of companies. Europe joins America's chip war with China. The Netherlands preparing to slap new export restrictions on semiconductor tech countering China.
The Dutch government made the announcement Wednesday, saying the move seeks to protect national security. The Netherlands is home to the world's top maker of microchip manufacturing machines, ASML. Its multi-million dollar lithography machines use powerful lasers to create the mini circuitry of computer chips. This marks the first time the nation has voiced a concrete plan for curbing chip exports to China, joining ongoing U.S. efforts to limit Beijing's access to high-tech microchips, thus to slow the country's military modernization. Back in October, the U.S. imposed sweeping export restrictions on American chip-making tools to China. But for the restrictions to be effective, other key suppliers in the Netherlands and Japan must take up the same policy. The ally countries have been in talks on the matter for months. China's foreign ministry responded Thursday. Spokesperson Mao Ning said China is firmly opposed to the decision and noted China had large representation with the Netherlands. The Netherlands trade minister says his country will introduce the new rules before this summer, while Japan is expected to update its chip equipment export policies as soon as this week. The biggest military exercise in Southeast Asia just wrapped up on Friday. The live fire drill took place in Thailand and is known as the Cobra Gold Exercise. This year, over 7,000 personnel joined from 30 countries, including the U.S. and Thailand. The event serves as a key platform for Washington to shore up alliances as it faces off with the Chinese Communist regime's assertiveness. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. The full tally of COVID-19 deaths in China remains unknown, but an estimate says it could be up to 36 times as many as Beijing claims. Here's what George Calhoun, director of the Quantitative Finance Program at Stevens Institute of Technology, had to say about China's extremely low official death rate. 37 deaths uh, after they release the... That's... I, you almost uh, think there's a sense of humor, dark humor there, to report a number like that. Calhoun explains how he came to the estimate and why it matters for the world. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.